This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey babies, this is Lar Park Lincoln, Tina from Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Hey bad news crews, Tommy has a joke for you. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today I will be welcoming... The gorgeous, the talented, the vivacious Devin DeVasquez. You all know her from such 80s classic movies as House 2, The Second Story, where she played the virgin that got sacrificed. She was Iris in Can't Buy Me Love. And she was also in Brian Usna's Society. And um, she was in Playboy, of course. She won $100,000 on Star Search. She's uh, an Emmy Award-winning producer of the series, The Bay. I mean, she's worn so many different hats. And we're going to have her on the show today and talk about all that stuff, and I just can't wait. It's been a couple months coming that we've been trying to arrange for this interview. And uh, rest in peace, Gallagher. I grew up watching, you know, his specials. You know, I used to rent them um, at the video store because they were on Paramount Home Video. They were Showtime specials. He sets the record 14 Showtime specials, whereas George Carlin has 14 HBO specials. And he was just a funny, funny guy. The watermelon man himself. Rest in peace, Gallagher. So yeah, here is my interview with Devin DeVasquez. Hey, Devin. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi, Tommy. How are you? I am just spectacular, and I cannot tell you what an honor this is. I think that uh, you're one of the most beautiful women of all time, and I thank you so much for taking the time today. Well, you're so sweet, and I thank you for that. At my age, I can use all the compliments I can get. <laughs> oh, don't be so modest. You look great. <laughs> you know. How are you, and where are you right now? I'm in Redding, Cali- I'm in Redding, California. Oh, you're in Cali. Okay. I don't know why I was thinking you were on the East Coast for some reason, but my clock is all off because we just recently uh, moved to Scottsdale. Yeah. So I've been moving in the frame of opening boxes, and yeah. my life is all in boxes right now, so... Uh, that's been my focus the last month now, trying to get settled in a new place. So, um, what did you want to talk about today? Well, going back in time, first I'd like to ask you, uh, did you gravitate toward acting and modeling early on in your childhood? No, I had no aspirations for acting or modeling. I was way too shy and Mm -hmm. introverted to even think of myself as an actress or a model back then. Um, That was just basically something I fell into. And I think over the course of the years, you you find what you're good at and what your, you know, what your true desire is in life. And you just kind of go from there. So I like doing it all. Mm -hmm. I like acting. I like model. I like very much modeling. I haven't been modeling in a long, long time, but um, now I'm more into producing, producing, writing, and and, um, growing spiritually as a person. That's way more important to me than all of the stuff now at this point in my life. Right. did, Did you have an original trajectory, like writing or something? I always had the writing, yes. I remember in, I don't know, I guess it was fifth grade, I wrote something and I got uh, praised for it and won some award or something. I had a, I took a script writing class at Santa Monica College and just wrote about what I, what I knew um, mm-hmm. and it, it turned into... I had to write, I think, 30 pages of a script, and I got an A in the class, and the the teacher was praising me for it. So I think I've always 
I've always gravitated to writing. I used to write poetry. I used to, yeah, writing has always been with me, for sure. Wow. I only wrote one poem, and I was 14 at the time, and I still remember it. <laughs> I, used to, I used to like to take my boyfriend's name. Mm -hmm. Like, this is so corny, but I just remember doing this in, in high school. I'd take my boyfriend's name and, like, you know, his name was John, so I would put J, you know, what J meant to me in words, and then the O, and start the sentence with the O, like, um, uh, joy you bring to my life is immeasurable, uh, only you are the one that I dream of, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and then they, the, and so I would, I would give like, instead of buying a card, I would write a poem and give it to him as a, as a gift. I thought it was m much more personal. So That's I cute. don't tend to, to buy, uh, cards. I tend to make my own, so to speak, when it's, when it's something special. Oh, that's cute. I like that. <laughs> so you were uh, born and raised in Baton Rouge? Yes, yes. Born and raised until ni age 19 when I moved to Chicago and and uh, decided I wanted to, to be in Playboy. And then the rest, <laughs> of, as they say, is history. Yeah, what was it like uh, growing up in Baton Rouge? Uh, really, honestly, I didn't have the best childhood. I grew up in and out of foster homes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't really have a lot of memories of a normal childhood, so to speak, mm -hmm. and I couldn't wait to get out of that mood, to be honest. I just, I always daydreamed as a kid and saw myself traveling and, and going to other places. I always had an affinity for, um, Europe, for France, um, for finding out about my roots, because I knew I was part French and Irish and American Indian, and I, I always had a, a, a desire to travel and see other places. Nice. So you, you attended uh, Louisiana State University, and you got featured in their pictorial. That's how, that, that's, that set the precedent for, um, for Playboy later, right? Yes, and I graduated a year early from high school, so I was 17 when Playboy discovered me. They just thought I was 18 because most kids were after high school. And so they really, this was, I think, pre-Playboy checking your ID to make sure yeah. you were 18. Um, so, yes, it started with the college Girls of the SEC in 1981, and then it took me uh, a while to muster up the courage to take all my clothes off and uh, for Playmate, which ultimately didn't happen until 1985. And then I was on the cover after I won uh, the championship 100 grand on Star Search in 1986. Which was a big yeah. deal because they really didn't feature Hispanic girls at that time on the cover. Yeah. Now you see them all over the place, thanks to Jennifer Lopez. And, you know, everything has changed over the last few decades in that regard. So, Abs but, yeah. Absolutely. I watched that um, Star Search on YouTube, and uh, I thought your hair was adorable, by the way. <laughs> It was teased about, I don't know, three feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. So how did it feel, they though? Bring in that, that back now. <laughs> they need to bring that back. They, to come back, right? They really need to bring back the 80s hair. They really do. <laughs> I don't but, know about the clothes, though. I, I No. From the 60s. I think they had a lot more style in the 60s. Don't even give me the 70s. <laughs> yeah, oh God, the 70s was awful. <laughs> <laughs> but how did it feel, though, in that moment, winning that money? Oh, my God. Well, I, first of all, never, ever um, 
had never been on on tel- national television before, so that was nerve wracking. And then it was before a live audience being judged, and and the stakes were so high, and the girls were so beautiful, and and this is the first time you saw models walk and, and talk at the same time. I mean, before you just saw them in photos, you really didn't see them, their personality or anything. So it was like the hottest thing at the time. I was definitely the grandfather of, um, you know, America's top model, yeah, American Idol. All those things are, are you know, subsidiary of Star Search because it was nothing like it and from it you 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 had stars that were born like um christina aguilera and uh, right. um uh, britney spears you know they all they all went on star search back then and you know singers actors models it was a it was a great exposure and 22 million people seeing you all uh, you know, judging you on your your ability to speak effectively. <laughs> Ed McMahon said, you know, you you not only had to wear the dress, uh, no matter how hot or heavy it was, to mm-hmm. walk down that runway and not trip and fall before judges judging you and um, uh, speaking effectively. Uh, announcing who would be up next on Star Search before a live audience was mm-hmm. something I had no experience doing, as I think most models back then did not. And y- you were doing a live TV show, so it it kind of threw me in the. I was the baby thrown in the bath water, so to speak, mm-hmm. and I got through it. And then winning it was just life-changing for me it was a huge huge thing for me back then yeah it was, it was a special thing back then star search you know there were no other reality shows there was like three there was three you know major networks there was a couple local channels and that was it there wasn't a hundred channels like there is today right and and it was um it was the thing so it was really could launch uh, you um, out there uh, to be seen and and bring new opportunities to any type of artist. So it was uh, a huge um, situation. I didn't know any model at the time or singer or uh, actor because they did have the acting category back then but didn't want to be on that show. So and I was on the third season so mm-hmm. it was still quite new and I think the show lasted like 11 years or something so over the years they had other playmates that was another thing that was a lot of people thought was not in my favor at that particular time because I had already done Playboy Mm -hmm. so they thought that was going to hinder my chances of winning the whole, um, uh, the whole entire uh, champion championship, but uh, the the uh, what do you call it? Um, casting uh, producer who cast all the models. Mm-hmm. She she was like, uh, I'm going to cast more playmates. <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot of other playmates ended up uh, competing. Um, after me, so I think it opened doors for all sorts of girls and all different ethnic types of girls because back then it seemed that everyone was more partial to blondes, especially on television. Absolutely, yes. Uh, was it was Ed McMahon um, uh, good to you? I mean, you did the Tonight Show yeah. later. Yeah, it was very nice, and you know, I still. I was my husband likes to say I was fresh off the boat, so to speak, <laughs> from Louisiana. So I still had my little southern accent, and and I was, you know, very um, uh, authentic because I couldn't be anything but myself. I didn't know what Hollywood really was or 
television or anything. It was, I was a model. And this was the first, uh, my first time in front of a, an audience, a camera, a competition, or anything of this sort. So it was, it was really quite um, nerve-wracking. <laughs> I can still feel it today, <laughs> how <laughs> nervous I was the whole time. Yeah, it's, it's that kind of stuff you never forget, no matter how old you, you are, you know? <laughs> and I'll never forget, too, the, the semifinals that I was in. I was so sick. I had a cold, and I was stuffy. My nose was stuffy. My eyes were watery, similar to when I shot my centerfold for some reason. I was sick then, too. And I, I remember thinking, oh, God, I look horrible. I'm not going to win this. I don't know why I'm so sick. You know, at that particular time, I just was. And I somehow blazed through it. And no one really noticed it as much as I did. And around that time, uh, you were dating Prince, right? Yes, yes. That was also very interesting and trippy because um, I had dated him six months prior. And um, and then I got on Star Search. And the strangest thing is the producer, she said, oh, you look like Apollonia, which everyone was saying yeah. back then. <laughs> And I mentioned that I had dated him a few months prior during Purple Rain. Mm -hmm. And she says, oh, I wish we could have Baby on the Star. We tried to get his music, but he doesn't let anyone use his music on television. And this was uh, right after Purple Rain, mm -hmm. Baby on the Star. I didn't. And I innocently didn't know about licensing fees and how much a song like that, first of all, would cost mm -hmm. for them to license to have it on Star Search. So I said, well, I'm still friends with him. Maybe I can ask if, if we can use it for one of my videos. And so I called his manager, who ended up being my manager after I won, uh, Steve Fardinoli, and I said, um, can you ask um, Prince if it's okay if we could use Baby on the Star uh, for one of my videos on Star Search? And he said yes. The producer told me this uh, because we're friends still today, and I included this in my book, my memoir that I wrote inspired by my time with Prince called The Day It Snowed in April. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed her and she says, I couldn't believe it. Not only did he give it to you, he gave it to you gave it to us for free. I had no idea. I didn't even know anything about licensing back then, so it was kind of a surprise to hear how generous he was about letting them use the song, which was the first time uh, he had allowed his music from the film to be played on television. And it was for my music video um, in the last uh, show that I did, ironically competing against um, Pierce Bronson's now wife, mm -hmm. Keely, Keely Shea Smith, who's now married to Pierce Bronson, mm -hmm. and I was doing my whole little modeling thing to Baby on the Star. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I talked to his uh, keyboard player, Matt Fink, a couple years ago. Yeah? Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, I wasn't uh, allowed to talk to the band, and they weren't allowed to talk to me. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. awful. I really didn't know anyone and never talked uh, to any of them other than uh, Bobby Z um, after his death because I'm friends with his wife. So it just, I really didn't get to know the band. Oh, that's 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 strange. I, I heard that there was a lot of strangeness with Prince <laughs> in certain yeah. situations. Yeah, he, 
he was always a little bit on the strange side in a very interesting way. My birthday is the day before his, June 6th. Uh-huh, so you're a little bit strange, too? I can be. I mean, I have a good twin and an evil twin. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what all Geminis say. <laughs> yeah, you're a Cancer, right? I'm a Cancer, yes. My grandmother was a Cancer. She was July 20th. Uh, I'm June 25th. Nice, nice. Well, I always say six months before, six months after Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Just, well, at least you're still in, in June, because I'm in June as well. Yeah. So did uh, Star Search and Playboy, is that what led you to acting? Yes, because mm -hmm. after I won, uh, I guess because uh, Prince uh, let us use Baby I'm a Star, apparently he was listening on the phone with his manager, who became my manager, Steve Fardinoli, mm -hmm. uh, the night that I won, because Star Search used to pre-tape and then air the show at a later date. Mm -hmm. And so um, he knew that I won, and he called and congratulated me. And then Steve Pardnoli, um said that Prince wanted uh, them to look after me because I had moved to uh, California from Chicago and after I won Star Search, and I had a lot of people approaching me for... Uh, management for um, acting and various things and they kind of took over and were guiding my career mm -hmm. and I think it's because Prince wanted to work with me um, and it just didn't work out timing wise uh, even though I was around him for three years and we were very good friends he uh, you know, like after the, the romance was brief and the friendship lasted much longer than the romance. But uh, his, his managers uh, actually uh, were the ones that got me on Johnny Carson, mm -hmm. that got uh, Can't Find Me Love, yep. um, uh, House 2, and uh, basically my first agent um, and and jump-started my career as, a, as an actress. Let, let's talk about House 2, because you're my fifth guest from that movie. Um, I've talked to Ari Gross, Ethan Wiley, Jonathan Stark, and I'm good friends with Lar Park Lincoln, all good people. Um, yeah, they're great. Yeah. Was the, was the role of uh, Virgin offered to you? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought that was just so funny and ironic that um, my first movie, I'm throughout the movie as this, this damsel in distress, <laughs> <laughs> Aztec Indian princess or whatever they're rescuing, and but I don't say a word in the movie. Mm -hmm. And so I was in several scenes, and it was very funny when I went on Johnny Carson to promote that movie because he was like, oh, I understand you're doing a movie. Do you have a lot of lines? <laughs> and I said, no, you, you have to see the movie. <laughs> you know? So it was, it was an interesting first um, uh, run or first uh, acting role in a film because I, I definitely learned a lot. And funny thing that happened was, I don't know if you knew this, but when they had me on that, uh, where they're, that you first see me, they're about to sacrifice me, and, mm -hmm. and the guys all rescue me, mm -hmm. the, the skull that was throughout the whole, the whole movie had fallen on my head. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a slight concussion in the middle of filming. They had to take me to the hospital. I had this big bump on my head because of the skull. <laughs> From the, the, the whole um, stunt of rescuing me ended up falling on my head. But, uh, oh. yeah, those guys were, were fun, and it was a fun movie to work on. 
Yeah, Ethan told me, you know, he, he didn't like the way the movie turned out, but uh, the first one, uh, he's proud of more. He wrote that, and uh, Steve Miner directed it. Yeah, he just didn't think he personally did a good job with the second one. Well, the second one was more of a comedy. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't really a horror film, even though it's in the category of a, of a horror film. It, it didn't, didn't have that. It wasn't written that way. It just didn't have that vibe. Yeah, and I mean, the first one did have comedy in it, but I think um, the comedy was a little bit more broader in the second one. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, I don't think they captured quite, because I saw the first one, too. Yeah. And I thought it was going to be more along the lines of that, but this one seemed a little campier, but was great for me to play a virgin, because my second movie turned out to be Can't Buy Me Love. Yeah. And gave me a lot of range, because I played the high school slut. Yeah. No? <laughs> I love Can't Buy Me Love. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've talked to Darcy DeMoss. She's very interesting. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, I love Darcy. We're very good friends. Yeah, and I just I just love this movie. I think Patrick Dempsey and Amanda Peterson had great chemistry. Um, yeah, so this was just another standard audition for you? Yes, it was another audition, and um, uh, basically I just remembered it being a big deal. Mm -hmm. as we filmed for a whole month in uh, Arizona, in yeah. Tucson, at Tucson High, and uh, Paula Abdul choreographed the African ant eater ritual. <laughs> and Patrick Dempsey was only 19 at the time, and I think I was the oldest one on the set. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being in, like, almost my mid-20s, playing 17 so it, it was fun it was a fun um movie uh for my first speaking role so to speak uh, yeah there had to have been laughter all day long because that's just the humor is so damn funny yeah i it, high school i love high school films like clueless i mm. love clueless um, I love Fast Times at Richmond High. Oh, the you best. Could, you could just feel when we were doing um, Camp I Me Love, which was called Boy Rent Girl. They mm -hmm. didn't even have, that was the working title when we were shooting it. And then they sold it to Disney, and they actually got the licensing for the Beatles song Camp I Me Love and changed the title, brought us back to shoot some pickup shots, and the movie came out that summer and was a little summer hit and made $35 million that summer at the box office, which put it in the category of one of hmm. the best high school films of the 80s, along with um, Fast Time at Richmond High. Oh, yeah. Last American Virgin, Just One of the Guys, so many great teen mm -hmm. movies from that period. Right. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, and also too, it was very rare to get a Beatles song licensed at that time. Like, like you. Yeah, I understand they paid like fifty grand for. Wow. For the song. Yeah, the music. I know this now, being married to Ron, Ron Moss, my husband, who mm -hmm. comes from classic rock music. I understand how royalties and all that stuff works for artists. And you, you have a a song, especially a hit song with a, a big name artist, you're going to be paying some big bucks <laughs> for it to be in a movie, for sure. Yeah. How, how was Amanda Peterson to work with? Oh, she was so sweet. She was 16 at the time, but so mature for her age and just, um, just a doll baby. And thought she was such a great actress. For me, I felt like I was just learning from everyone, you know, including Darcy, because Darcy had been uh, acting a lot longer than me. Everyone had been acting a lot longer than me. Um, Gerardo. Um, yeah. Uh, Gerard Mejia. 
Yeah, it's like every, it, it, you could just feel that, that there was a vibe on the set, and mm -hmm. you, could just, you could just feel that it was going to do something, it was going to go somewhere. So I was thrilled to be a part of it. Uh, Steve Rash, uh, he had directed the Buddy Holly story years before. Uh, how was he as a director? The only thing he said to me, because, you know, I had lines like, um, remember, I was one of the cools, but I wasn't a cheerleader. Yeah. I was I was Iris the virus. You know, I was the girl <laughs> that gave more, gave more rides than Greyhound, right? Right. So they, all the girls took turns going out with him. Uh, so, of course, I had to check him out since all the cheerleaders had been with him, you know. So he ends up at the, the Christmas party with me, and, of course, he's reciting um, Cindy's poetry to me because he had gone to first or second base with the, uh, with the cheerleaders, but he went all the way with me. You know, so by the time we were doing the scenes where I had lines like, um, uh, uh, I can't even remember the lines now, uh, uh, at the malt shop when I show, showed up and he's trying to impress everyone and I say something like Paris or or France, or Rome, or Paris, and he says, no, beautiful downtown Burbank or something, you yeah. know, and goes <laughs> off to talk to Cindy. Um, I remember Steve Rash saying to me, Devin, with you, it's like putting sugar on ice cream. Don't act sexy. Don't, you don't need to act sexy. You are. Just... Mm say the line. <laughs> so that was one of the first directorial things that I remember him saying to me, and it was almost like, less is more with you. Don't play the sexy part. You don't need to. So I was like, okay. <laughs> That's good advice, yeah. <laughs> My favorite line um, at the dance when um, when when Patrick Dempsey is doing that crazy dancing. There's that one girl there. She's like, "Oh, he must be in special ed." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember that being so fun. Oh my god, we had to, we had we had to do it over and over. Yeah, I, I just remember that scene being a lot of fun. Yeah, I was in special ed for 10 years, so that's hilarious to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially since he closed his eyes and he's doing it because he was watching the African anteater ritual. Yeah. And then he opens his eyes and he sees everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. It was just, oh my gosh, such yeah. great memories. I'm so happy I was a part of that film. So. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. You were also in one of my top three favorite episodes of Married with Children, the one that caused a lot of controversy when it first aired. <laughs> yes, they told me it was because of me that the show stayed on the air. It stayed on the air for Really? <laughs> yeah. They were about to cancel them. <laughs> I didn't even know I remember this. Oh, my God. When I got that part and I did it, you know, they yeah. put pasties on my nipples because mm -hmm. even though I had my hands crossed mm -hmm. and he faints when I take off the bra, it was done before a live audience. So they had, they didn't, like the audience didn't see me on um, uh, live. They saw me on their, on their TV screens. You know how when you go sit into a live uh, taping, right. you get to see what's going on on the stage, basically, like a sitcom. They did, that wasn't the case for this. And so what happened was, um, after I did the scene, uh, the next day, I remember Ed O'Neill saying, you saved our show. And I was like, what are you <laughs> talking about? He goes, because I took my bra off on primetime TV for the first time. This was a new show on Fox. Mm -hmm. And 
several people. I think it was some politician's wife. I can't remember her name now. Yeah, uh, Recolter, her last name was. She had written in saying the show was distasteful, should be taken off the air, wasn't fit for kids to see mm -hmm. at that time slot, because I think it was on at 8 o'clock um, at night. Yeah. And so it ended up, the controversy ended up getting on Entertainment Tonight and and Tom Brokaw and Extra, not Extra, entertain, yeah, I don't know, all the news channels were talking about it, and they kept showing, even though I undo the bra, you see my hand undo the bra from the back, and you mm -hmm. see my hand across my breast when he faints. So you really don't see anything, right? This is 1989. And I remember <laughs> I was actually at Eddie Murphy's house wow. cooking, cooking, I don't know what, gumbo or something for several people that day, and I had met Keenan Ivory, Wayans, yeah. who was the, and I, I remember I was getting married, and I was moving to Tennessee, and my roommate knew Eddie, and it's a long story, I used to see Eddie all the time, uh, through um, uh, Steve Bardnoli and Prince, and that whole camp, so I knew lots of people in Hollywood that I was friends with, Arsenio Hall, different people mm. that I knew over the years. And the night that that show aired, I actually had to ask um, uh, Keenan Ivory Wayans if he could tape it for me because <laughs> it was airing. And, and I was, I remember at Eddie Murphy's house and he said, just ask Keenan to tape it for you. And so when I watched it and it mm. became this big controversial thing, and they, Ed O'Neill told me, uh, because I, I was friends with him and went to several parties with, I went to one party with him with Vanity. Mm -hmm. We had a picture together, me, Ed, and, and Vanity. And uh, he was he was like, yeah, you saved the show because they were going to cancel. <laughs> we, were so, we were so nervous that they were going to cancel the show. And the controversy just, uh, helped it for some reason and stayed on the air mm -hmm. for, I don't know, 13 years or something, right? Uh, 11, yeah. Okay. Ah, that is crazy. Yeah, I mean, I literally guffaw when I see that episode. The old man behind the counter with the pantyhose. Oh my God, that's a scream. <laughs> <laughs> those, were the good, those were the days when sitcoms were really funny. Yes. And that's my favorite sitcom of all time. My my sense of humor is very body, and I just I just crack up. I have um, all eleven seasons on DVD. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! I really like um, Ed and Modern Family too, though. Oh yeah, I, I like that kind of humor too. Yeah, I watched it but mainly because of Sofia Vergara. I had a crush on her. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know, most of the movies I've done. I ha has been comedy. In fact, I studied with Lisa Kudrow, who was my teacher. Oh. And most of, mo because I had acting teachers like Ivana Chubbuck, mm -hmm. who, who was Brad Pitt's first, one of his first teachers. I studied with a lot of really good um, acting coaches, and they all said, you know, you're so sexy and pretty, Devin, if you can do comedy, and most of the things that I did were comedy, I mean, or dark comedy, like in society, yeah. that was considered dark comedy, and I always had good timing for some reason, naturally, so I was always good with comedy. Yeah, I, I talked to Brian Usna two years ago, and we talked about society. Um, I asked him maybe four questions the entire two hours because that guy will lead you down rabbit holes like no one's business. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know what? Yeah. He had, they had hired another girl to play Clarissa. It was, it was Judy Aronson, right? Oh, I don't remember her name, but they, they the first 
four days of filming, they decided she wasn't right. And they called me back in and had me do every, Brian had me do every scene in his office. I think they were nervous about having me play the lead um, because I didn't have very much acting experience. I had only done Can't Buy Me Love and um, House 2. So he just wanted to make sure I could do the scenes. And mm -hmm. the rest, as they say, is history. So <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a good movie. And Brian told me, you know, he wished that movie was more well-known than it is. You know, I mean, I'm sure it has a, a, a cult following amongst people. I, I rarely ever hear about it, though. Um, but making it was fun? Making it was grueling. It was fun at times, but it, it was a 30-day shoot, and it was really a, a grueling um, shoot. And I... I know the the film did really well overseas, and I had had several people tell me they'd seen seen it in different languages, like German, Italian, and I used to have um, fans bring it in when I would do glamour cons. Mm -hmm. um, I was really surprised to see it in so many languages. But I think the reason why the movie, even though it it came out in the theaters. And it was a strange movie. It, yeah. it actually made it to the theaters. The, the pro producer and, and the producers were uh, battling some legal situations. So I think the movie probably could have been more well-known had it been maybe um, promoted better uh, because people seem to like it. Yeah, it's a pretty good movie. Very original, I think. And uh, you had a you had a sex scene in it that was pretty nerve wracking at first, right? Um, it was a little bit nerve wracking because Billy Warlock was Billy's character was supposed to lose his virginity to Clarissa, and I think he came from soap where they really didn't. Uh, show much or do anything. Um, they were very tame, their love scenes on soap. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in film, you know, I'd already had a love scene with Patrick Dempsey. It wasn't a big deal to me, but <laughs> it was more of a big, bigger deal to Billy, it seemed. He was more uncomfortable because um, he was supposed to show an orgasm. Mm hmm. Uh, you know, the yeah. camera panning up to his face. I remember um, Brian says, and we, we want to see that, or you know, we want to see that orchestra. And so I remember him getting a little bit upset during the scene because there were, what, 30 people filming you and you're having to uh act like you're having an orgasm, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I just remembered um, having to um, talk to him because he was, it seemed like I was more comfortable than he was. And in, in all honesty, it, I was just doing my job. Right. Um, I, you know, I didn't know he was so uncomfortable during during that scene, but that's the only tension that I remembered. Um, and he was in every scene. I think he was just exhausted mm -hmm. from working um, because he was in pretty much every scene. If you watch the movie, it's all about him. So. And how, uh, going back to Keen and Ivory Wades, uh, how was doing a low-down, dirty shame with him? Well, that was so was so cute about uh, I had just met him uh, briefly at um, Eddie's house and I said uh, he said he had created this show called In Living Color at the time and then I got married and moved to Tennessee mm -hmm. and I remember when I unfortunately got divorced and moved back Hollywood a few years later and I went on an audition 
And my agent, my manager called me and said, Devin, you didn't get that part that you auditioned for, but the director likes you and knows you and wants to write a part specifically for you for this movie. And I was like, who's the director? I didn't even know. It was Keenan Ivory Wayan. And so Keenan wrote that part specifically for me mm-hmm. uh, in Low Down Dirty Shame. It didn't exist. And then, uh, how about uh, Citizen Toxie? About who? Citizen Toxie, the Toxic Avenger 4. Now, you know, that's something Julie Strain took me to, Mm -hmm. and I didn't even know anything about it. It was (laughs) like, Devin, come with me, we're going to go do this. (laughs) And I I I don't think I knew anything about this. Okay. Julie Strain, did did she pass away? She did, unfortunately. Yeah. She had early dementia from uh, a fall from a horse when she was younger that caused the early dementia. Yeah, Um, that's awful. She told me about this, and she actually lost most of her early childhood memories and had to learn her ABCs all over again. I'm actually going to produce the Julie Strain story oh, good. As to her because uh, there was not any closure for her fans mm-hmm. and her friends, and I'm working. I'm going to start working on that with her sister. Oh, good. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah, I, I have heard that she was a force of nature. She was very, very funny. People loved her. Yeah. It was bigger than life. Yeah, she was, yeah. You were friends with her for a very long time? I was friends with her for a long time, and she def- she she took lots of pictures of me. She was a photographer. She was, she was a force of nature, like you said, you know. She was just, mm-hmm. had a big passion for pretty much every aspect of the business, but she loved being in front of the camera, Julie. Oh. So what made you get into producing? I just felt like um, I think show business is just that. It's, mm-hmm. it's entertainment, but it's also business, and I've always enjoyed business and marketing. And I felt like when you're behind the camera, you have a lot more control as to what is in front of the camera. And so I got more interested as I got older in, in uh, producing um, uh, what's in my head, what I write, what um, now with my husband we produce together, um, our own projects, because you have more control uh, over the content. Mm-hmm. You've won four Emmys. God, that must blow your mind. <laughs> Uh, actually, I won five. Oh, five, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's pretty crazy, huh? Five Emmys for producing. Um, are there any other playmates that have done that? I Do can't think of a single one. No, you're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I am very proud of the Bay, the Bay, the series, Amazon, now Peacock Television. Um, because it's, it was that little web series that became, uh, the pioneer of some of the digital platforms Mm -hmm. of content that you see today that was just leaps and bounds more interesting than what you were seeing on television. You know, most of the soaps, I mean, what Gregory Martin did was take the concept of soaps, which he loved, and mm-hmm. and he loved writing and creating um, characters around um, names and faces that you knew already that were on soaps, and he got a variety of those people and gave them different roles to play. Like, my husband as John Blackwell is nothing like Ridge Forrester, for example. Um, 
I have a lot of great ideas for um, doing things a little bit out of the box. And I know I like those guys, and I thought they were young and energetic, which they are, and I could see them going places. So I talked um, Ron into uh, giving it a shot right right after um, he left uh, Bold and Beautiful. And they came, they had been watching us mm-hmm. uh, online as, as producing team, as, uh, you know, we were doing Ron's Garage, which was basically me doing things that I love, like cooking, and, he, and my husband doing things that he loved, which was music, and combining that at home, which is now what most people do with podcasts. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they do what they love. And they talk about topics they want to talk about, and and you anybody can do and create their own content online. But we're just doing it way before it became more more mainstream to do, I guess you could say. Right. And it was more of a homegrown idea of just getting trying to get ahead of technology, the way technology was changing. So. The Bay, I thought, was interesting because they didn't shoot. Uh, they shot everything on, on location. They didn't shoot in a studio like all the other soaps did. They shot everything on location, which gave them that nighttime, primetime feeling. And um, they used all the soap stars that everybody knew and loved, but gave them interesting roles to play, Mm -hmm. different from what everyone knew them from. And I was just excited to be a part of that. So a lot of of, uh, the beginning part of uh, those Emmy, the first Emmy win was Mm -hmm. very, very exciting. (laughs) And then they just kept coming. (laughs) Yeah. Where do you keep your Emmys? Um, you know, we are still unpacking because we're downsizing since our yeah. kids have all grown up. So we, the house we lived in for 15 years, we didn't need such a big house anymore. And we're half the time in Europe mm-hmm. um, and half the time. we. I, I gravitate to warmer climate. I've lived in New York and Chicago and California for 30 years, I prefer a warmer climate. And so since we're, we decided we're going to be um, in America during the winter months, we decided um, that uh, Arizona was more fitting for us because you can hike and bike and play golf and mm-hmm. do so many things outside in the winter months here that the weather's absolutely beautiful. So... We're loving it, but um, to be honest, I'm still unpacking boxes, mm-hmm. so I, I can't find all of my things right now. Yeah. I'm probably 80% there, and uh, um, what did you just ask me about? Oh, where you keep the uh, Emmys. <laughs> oh, where I keep the Emmys, right. I, that's what I meant. As I haven't found them all yet. So I have uh, several of them in our family room mm. above the, t- the television. We kept them in our theater at our last house. So I keep them where we watch TV. Mm. And I have one in my office, and my husband has one in his office. Nice. Yeah, I lived in Arizona for three... So, you know, they're heavy. Mm-hmm. They're, they could be a weapon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the Emmy is way heavier than the Oscar. I held an Oscar once. Uh-huh. It's so light compared to an Emmy. Yeah, I also heard a Grammy is uh, pretty sharp. You can cut yourself pretty badly on those. <laughs> yep. So I keep one in my office, which is right near my bed. So if somebody tried to break in, I'll hit them over the head with the Emmy. 
that's also awesome. But uh, you did get to uh, fulfill your uh, dream of writing. You've written how many books now? Uh, I've written five books. Five books. Yeah, one, the hmm. first one was The Naked Truth About Pinup, which was mostly encouraged um, because at the time there were lots of girls hmm. that were wanting to, to have a pinup career, hmm. be a pinup model. I mean, I think you see that um, today online a hmm. lot with the, the success of Dita Von Teese, who I modeled with and knew. 20 years ago, so I was always um, uh, trying to give advice to other up-and-coming models at the time of how to how to have a, a career as a pinup model if they wanted that, and Hess gave me a quote for that book, and I used the quote from my interview that I did with Betty Page, mm -hmm. so I was very proud of that book and then I wrote a funny um, relationship book with my husband called My Husband's a Dog, My Wife's a Bitch yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like men are from Mars, women are from Venus right <laughs> um, so that was kind of a funny um, my perspective of men, his perspective of women mm -hmm. and relationships and, and, and then I wrote uh, true Age, Timeless Beauty, which was really encouraged by an attorney friend of mine when I was in my late 30s. He was like, what's your beauty secret? What are your beauty secrets, Devin? You look so young. And I said, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, if you wrote something along those lines, it would really sell well. And I started writing about beauty secrets, mm -hmm. thinking, okay, there's not a cream or anything physically that I'm using here, yeah. so what's the secret? And I started thinking about how we think and feel about things, about people, about yourself, about... Mm -hmm. And so I made it more of a spiritual book about how to manifest what ever you desire and how to keep how to get your life in balance and I'm writing the follow up how to keep your life in balance called true wisdom timeless spirit nice which which I think I'm going to give away because most people need balance in their lives especially today so it didn't what meant to be my beauty Secret turned out to be more of a spiritual beauty secret, I guess. And and then I wrote um, my memoir, The Day It Snowed in April, which I didn't intend to do, but it happened when Prince mm. passed away and all these memories came back to me. I was very emotional about his death, as any Prince fan was, and... All of a sudden, I realized how precious that, that time in my life was, and it, all these memories came back, mm -hmm. and I'd never kept mm -hmm. a diary, so I thought, you know, I better write this down now while I can remember everything still. Yeah. And it was, it was sort of a, a, a weird feeling that he was sort of guiding me to do this, because that's when I spoke with Bobby Z for the first time because his wife was my friend on, on Facebook and then she wanted to talk to me because she mm -hmm. knew me through another mutual friend and uh, Apollonia has talked to me since and invited me to be on her show and I still kept in touch with Jerome Benton uh, because he talked to me back then. There were very few people in Prince's camp that knew me or talked to me. So all of a sudden, everybody wanted to talk mm -hmm. people that were close with Prince. And so I wrote it down to give half of the proceeds 
that would come from it for the life of the book to one of his charities. And I picked uh, Yes, We Can, the charity that he created for um, kids, Mm -hmm. uh, because I knew that that was probably something that was near and dear to him and my little way of giving back something. Um, but I just did it as a, as a, as my instinct guided me to do. And looking back, I'm glad I did write it all down now. Mm -hmm. Do you have any upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Um, we produced, my husband and I, a movie in Italy called Surprise Trip, and it's coming out internationally. It already came out in Italy this summer, a romantic comedy starring him uh, through our new production company, Eleven Eleven Film, and uh, we're producing a Western, which I'm going to act in. I haven't acted in a long time, so I'm looking forward. You can see <clears throat> the teaser on uh, on 1111film.com. Uh, nice. But, or, or online on my Instagram or his Instagram. So we're going to produce the Western, <clears throat> and um, I'm excited about that one. Oh, awesome. There needs to be more Westerns. You know, I miss Westerns so much. They were such a part of um, of the movie business and the TV business for so long. And then <clears throat> they died out at some point. But they've, they've always been made, you know. Mm-hmm. My husband's always wanted to make one. He grew up watching Bonanza. So did I. And, you know, all the Big Valley. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, yeah. That- so I think that we need to go back to um, good old-fashioned uh, content that makes people happy. And uh, I'm happy uh, to produce that type of content, family-oriented content. Absolutely. Real quick, we got to play my secret silly game. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose. It's just pure benign fun. And how the game works is, Devin, I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question, and I answer it. And feel free to comment on the answers, because they'll be funny. Okay. Okay. Devin, are you ticklish? (laughs) Uh, Sometimes. Nice. Tommy, are you ticklish? Oh, yes. If you tickle me without warning, I will hit you in the groin. But if you t- tickle me uh, with a warning, it'll be pleasurable for me. <laughs> Where are you ticklish? Uh, the soles of my feet, um, around my belly button, and like under my shoulder blade. Under your shoulder blade? Really? Under shoulder blade, yeah. Yeah, uh, I've I've had people sneak up under me and just tickle my shoulder blades. I'm like, stop it, stop it. <laughs> um, I'm ticklish around my knees. Oh yeah. 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 Um, what's your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. My favorite part of my body, or. A man's body. Yeah, it, it could be anything. Yours, somebody else's, it don't matter. I'd say the chest. The chest. What's the favorite, what's your favorite part of the body? The belly button. Oh. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, it's very tantalizing. <laughs> uh, what color are your toenails painted? Red. Love it. What color are your toenails painted? Uh, right now, they're not painted. Last time they were, they were e- Easter egg blue. <laughs> okay. You, must have, you were going to a, a Halloween party or something? Actually, no. I was going to a uh, Comic-Con. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been painting my toes since I was 13. I like to go elaborate colors. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, what would you say is your best personality trait? My best personality trait, I think, is my positive way of looking at things. You are a very positive person. I'd like to think so. Yes, I'm more positive than negative, and I project that. And then for me, um, I have, yep. b being a Gemini, sure. it's okay, people forget. Uh, being a Gemini, I have empathy, and I have no filter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? There's a stinky smell that just makes me gag. Oh. I would say, yeah, like, um, old garbage. Yeah. Ugh. There's stinky smell that makes you gag. Either farts or feet. So you don't like, you don't have a foot fetish. I do, I do have a foot fetish, actually, but I like them to be clean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they just have, like, a mildly sweaty smell, I can tolerate that. But other than that, if they've been in socks all day, nah, that's a no bueno for me. Ooh. Yeah, I would think so. And I do have I to... Like to wear, I like to wear open toe shoes and sandals, mm -hmm. so I don't have smelly feet. That's good. And I, I do have to admit, Devin, you do have beautiful feet. Thank you. I actually um, was a foot model for mm -hmm. a while. Yeah, I did see uh, pictures. I was like, wow, was she a foot model? I was like, wow, they're beautiful. Yeah. I have little feet. My, I'm like a size six and a half. Mm -hmm. Mine are 16. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah, I'll tell you, um, when I started going to school when I was five, I had a, a size five shoe, and I swear to God, each age matched my shoe size, and it stopped at 16. That's funny. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, people are just, wow, you have big old feet. I was like, yes, I do. You know, that's why they're so accessible to be I've tickled. I've never met any, well, Shaquille O'Neal probably had the biggest feet, because I knew this girl that dated him. Mm -hmm. And I and I met him a couple of times, mm -hmm. and he was one of the biggest guys I've ever seen. I think his foot size was like a twenty-three. Mm -hmm. Wow, God, that is crazy. I, crazy. I I I talked to an actress who had a one-night stand with Wilt Chamberlain. You know, who was like seven foot two, and she's like oh. six foot. She's pretty tall herself, but like, yeah, like he like he like nearly put her in the hospital. <laughs> I have a joke for you. Uh, what do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? Uh, I don't know. What? A liar. Oh, okay. <laughs> they, all, they all do, right? Yep. <laughs> Exactly. Devin, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, you, I, Like I said, you are still gorgeous, and you are just so amazing. I, I hope um, that Western uh, turns out really well. I'll keep an eye out for it and uh, that next book that you're writing. And I hope uh, you stay safe out there in Arizona. I, I lived there for three months, and I couldn't take it. I had to get out of there. It was just too hot. <laughs> well, I'm never going to be here in the summers. I'm always going to be in Italy in the summers. So it's beautiful in the winters. And thank you for that. I really appreciate um, being on your show. It was loads of fun. And um, thank you for the best wishes. I just hope to stay healthy and uh, keep the faith that uh, things are going to get better in our world. God bless you, Devin. Thank you so much, and happy holidays. You too. Thank you. Bye, Bye Tommy. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Devin DeVasquez. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a nice lady, huh? That was just a great conversation. She's very deep and insightful, and she sounds spiritual as well. I'm so glad that we had that conversation. 
Welp, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.